Greetings and welcome to the very first episode of the Voice in the Game podcast. We have a fantastic guest today. I'm super excited. Paul Diaspara, Crown Ref's creator, producer of much, much fantastic content for basketball officials. I'm super excited, as always, to get started with uh, an introduction to Paul. As always, we're supported by our tremendous production crew. What time is it? Gus and Oliver are on the case, keeping all of the levels correct, the lighting, the audio, the video. We are here with a great show for you today. Our guest, Paul Diaspara, let's go. Paul's a high school ref and a collegiate official who is the creator of the Crown Refs podcast, where he discusses rules, plays, and situations that help to provide awareness and education for players, coaches, and fans. I'm thrilled to have him join us today, Paul Diaspara. Paul, how are you? I'm doing super well. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Fantastic. I'm in beautiful uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, you are in New York? Yes, just north of the city in uh, Hartsdale, New York. Excellent. Excellent. And has your season started? Are you on the verge? Um, it hasn't ended. Collegi- the cl- <laughs> it's Indeed. a year-round uh, that we do, but uh, no, it hasn't officially started yet. Probably do some scrimmages in late October. So looking forward to the start of the 2022-23 season. Oh, really? Yeah, we've had some collegiate, uh, you know, scrimmages, jamborees over the weekend. So I'm feeling it a little bit. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no, it's different. College running is a little different. Really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So... Paul, you are a voice in the officiating community through your podcast and all the things that you do. Um, Why don't you give us a brief overview of how you got started officiating and what your journey looks like? Sure. I got started in 2012. My mother uh, worked for an athletic department at my old high school, so she was used to speaking to referees and just kind of engulfed in the referee culture when I was going to school to get my master's for physical education. Um, she recommended being an official, um, didn't, didn't really, uh, wasn't too interested in it in the beginning. Cause I was just coming off like a playing career and not being too fond of officials, I guess. Um, it seems like a lot of people have that in common. Um, but once I turned over and became an official, started to find the love, um, started to get inspired by other officials that I thought were great and thought were going to have a big career ahead of them. So I wanted to kind of be part of that and just studied the craft year after year from like 2012 and and obviously till now. Um, But five years into me really uh, studying the craft of officiating, I wanted to give back. Um, I'm a teacher by trade, so I've been teaching 12 years. So it's a natural transition for me to teach officials now. And um, I just noticed early on with my content creation, a lot of the... um, great feedback I was getting. A lot uh, officials were hitting me up because of the improvements they were able to make just from the basic conversations that we were recording. So that just kind of inspired me to do more. And um, my goal is to impact you know, more officials than anyone ever has, just one by one, going slow, just connecting you know, one official at a time, just trying to make a, a deep impact one by one. And if you could add that up for a career, you know, it might be able to, to, to impact a lot. So That's a little bit about my backstory with my officiating and uh, with Crown Refs. Fantastic. So at what point, um, you know, you you dabble in officiating, at what point and what was the switch that made you say, hey, I can be pretty good at this and I really enjoy doing this and I want to learn, you know, how to master this? Yeah, I mean, I I, I met uh, an official pretty early in my career who I thought was just incredibly talented. I I thought he was going to make it to the NBA one day and still uh, think he can. And, you know, when you meet people kind of early in a journey that can have a big impact on you, um, it can make a big difference. So I saw the level that he was performing at and and I connected to that and I wanted to to get there, you know, like I would watch his games and we would break down his games afterwards and I would call and ask questions. And a lot of the things we do as officials when we, um, when we get the itch to grow and, you know, that's constantly what we're doing is we're trying to improve. Um, You're always going to make mistakes and, 
everybody's making mistakes all the way up to NBA officials. And that contributes to why we love it so much, I think, is because we're there's just always work to do. There's always work to do. So just seeing a little bit about where this official and other officials in my circle were going to potentially take their career. And I, uh, you know, I wanted to take a gander at it and kind of follow in, in their footsteps. That's exciting. That's a great story. Um, yeah, you're getting that spark and that itch is a, sort of an exciting time. It's like, yeah. But then, you know, when officials get that, it's like, well, how can I get better? You had somebody there, you know, in your life there that was there to impact you. Um, officials across the country now um, can look to online resources. And one of the great ones that's available to them is the Crown Refs podcast. How did you go about making the transition from, hey, I'm a basketball official, I believe in the craft, et cetera, and to, I'm going to become a podcaster, right? How did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't necessarily me wanting to tap into podcasting. It was back to me being a teacher and kind of making the switch. Okay. I've been teaching eight years. I've been an official eight years. Now my next move is now I want to teach officials just the easy blend for me to do that. And when I noticed early on the impact, like I said, that it was having, a lot of the conversations I was having early on uh, with Mr. Pink, who, who's the guy I recorded my first videos with, I just thought it was basic stuff, to be honest. I just thought everybody kind of knew it. And I quickly realized, you no, know, that there was a big education gap, that a lot of the things that I knew were not common knowledge. So I basically wanted to share everything I knew. It's like the first um, ref that I ever mentored, Javid Trotman. You guys have probably heard, heard me mention his name. He's uh, like a brother to me. Um, I, I connected with him in 2015 and he had just gotten out of the class. And I, I had just gotten to a point where I was starting to feel confident in my ability to mentor and teach and develop and train. So it was just a perfect combination where Javid was like, I want to learn everything that you have all of your updates, everything that you've spoken about before with, you know, other officials. It's like, I want you to teach me everything. And conversely, I wanted to give Javid everything I had. So that was a great starting point. That was the first official that I mentored. And it really laid down the entire foundation of what I'm doing now with everybody. As deep as I went with Javid, that's how deep I'm trying to go with every single official that I'm meeting now. Um, so just kind of having that early reps with him and a couple other uh, officials in my physical circle, then I'm saying, wait, now I can go online and have a bigger reach. I can connect with way more instead of just doing physically one official at a time. Now I can put out messages and recordings that can impact and reach officials uh, from around the world. So I just did it one platform at a time. I started with Instagram and then eventually to YouTube. Then I got to give Mike uh, Despali. He, I had a game with him one day in 2018. This was a few months into me starting Crown Refs. And he was like, you should start a podcast on Anchor. It's the most simple app. All you do is download it. You basically press record. And when you're done, you hit another button, upload, and it sends you uh, sends your podcast to Spotify, Apple Music. So again, it was just the opportunity to reach more officials through that medium, which was podcasting. Um, and you know, there's going to be other mediums that happen. VR is like maybe a few years away, 10 years away, but I'm going to be training officials in the metaverse, like whenever that happens. So it's not necessarily one specific platform. I'm just trying to like master them all and try to have them all kind of in as part of the portfolio of officials. Cause not everybody listens to podcasts, not everybody reads a newsletter, but if I can kind of meet everybody in this one channel where they are, then I can uh, really connect and, and train. Fantastic. Well, you're making a great impact and uh, it's exciting times ahead. And I appreciate you mentioning reps, right? Because so much of what we do as officials in all the circumstances we get ourselves into, um, reps, reps, you know, we just need the work, right? This type of play, mm -hmm. this type of interaction with a player, this type of interaction with a coach. If we can get reps, we're better. And that's one of the challenges we face. Um, so. And, and add to that. That's one thing I wanted to document was like, you spoke about play types. How many play types have you seen in your life? I don't know, a thousand, 2000 could be 10,000. I'm not sure. But part of what my content is, is I want to identify every single play type that I've ever seen, because you're going to see it. Your friends, your other officials are going to see it. And if you haven't seen it, it's going to happen. So I kind of want to like document and provide, um, 
insight and training to all these different play types that we see. Yeah. And of course, if we can see a play online or in an Instagram video or in a TikTok video or what have you and talk about it, we can learn, you know, in that setting so that when we I get out on the court, we are just better prepared to uh, rule on plays uh, accurately and successfully. So Absolutely. asking for a friend, what's your favorite podcast question that you like to ask guests? Hmm. Good question. Don't know if I have a great answer. I, I find myself asking a lot of the questions kind of worded a little bit differently. Um, so I'm probably not going to pick one specific question. I'll just uh, give you a few answers. We love hearing officials origin story. So if we're interviewing a guest who maybe works D1 or the NBA, we kind of want to know how he got there and all the steps that he took and way before he or she ever um, made that next step or that next jump to, to where they are now. And that's very helpful for us officials, kind of hearing everybody else's story. And then just, uh, I love asking about communication, something I'm super passionate about. So like communication and game management, I want to know how the best in the world um, treat those categories and those parts of the game. So those are just a couple uh, to name. Excellent. And you've had what an incredible array of guests that you've had. Um, NBA officials, high-level D1 officials, really the, the main voices in the officiating community. Uh, how, what was your process through getting comfortable with that? Oh, yeah, I'm just, you know, chopping it up with uh, Mark Davis or Mark Wunderlich. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of my comfort and, like, my confidence comes way outside of basketball. And it's really um, – I'm grounded in gratitude and just a pure appreciation for life. Like, every single day I think about that. Um, so it makes everything else so easy for me. Like, everything I've done with Crown Rest has not been difficult. It's not been difficult because I've enjoyed it. This is stuff I like to do, right? So uh, why would I be uncomfortable in front of Mark? He's a fellow officiating brother. That's the way I look at it. Everybody that, that I interview, I treat them like they're a partner in our locker room. It's equal, right? I'm not big timing you. You're not big timing me. So I just kind of take that, um, take that with me with all my relationships. And it's all about, you know, equal respect. And I'm trying to provide uh, the person I'm working with or communicating with more value than they're providing me. So yeah, uh, initially with a few of the guests, there might be a few of those moments where it's like, wow, you know, look at who's on the other side of my computer. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, I'm all about treating everybody fairly with respect and um, just enjoying and being comfortable in the moment. Fantastic. Um, so what the tagline from the podcast er, is serve the game. And that's a really mm -hmm. powerful uh, statement. What does that mean to you? You know, you kind of look at the game as like it's up here, right? You're holding the game up, kind of like we do when we're when I teach officials how we should properly hold the ball, very simply like a waiter, because we're here to serve the game. So if you kind of look at the game in that instance where everything the game is up here and everybody else, all the other participants are below it, and the game is most important, and nobody comes before the game, no official, no player, no coach right? The game is more important than all of us. So kind of treating it like that, like it's, you know, this holy thing that we all will all love and appreciate and, and want to keep pure and want to provide that fairness to everybody that's kind of participating in it. So when you look at the game and you hold it up on a pedestal like that, it makes your decisions throughout the game on how to manage different personalities and just knowing what is best for the game. Like doing what is best for the game is always a good self-talk game management strategy that you can use. Cause if you follow that, a lot of times you'll, it'll take you to the right answer and doing what's right for the game at that moment. So that's some of my thoughts on when we talk about serving the game and what, what it means to kind of hold the game up on a pedestal like that. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah, we like to talk about uh, here at a better official, you know, game crew you, right. And if, if, if people are really focusing in putting the game first, all the stakeholders, right. Coaches, partners, et cetera, it, it shows. And in the absence of that, if, if somebody's trying to, you know, interject themselves at the wrong level there, right, putting themselves ahead of the game, um, that, that shows as well and shows we need to deal with things a little bit differently. 
So, and I think coaches put themselves ahead of the game a lot with their actions. That's a great example of what we're talking about. When a coach is acting unsportsmanlike or showing disrespect to an official, I think that's a perfect example of them putting themselves ahead of the game. You, you know? are absolutely so, correct. Absolutely correct. And there's so I'll many instances. <laughs> not a lot of people are talking about communication. Not a lot of people are talking about coaches publicly. I haven't heard too many officials touch on it. So that's why I'm really proud of what we're doing with Crown Refs, because it comes from a place of professionalism, respect and courtesy, number one. But then on top of that, having the ability to judge and discern between sportsmanlike conduct and unsportsmanlike conduct and just having that respect for the game. So if we all respect the game, you know, that's a that's a great way to be. Um, so it just makes it easy kind of to identify when people don't. Yeah, because so many things are baked into the game. Uh, you know, the sportsmanship, uh, respect, et cetera. These things are, are are baked into the game. And if you are displaying something that deviates from that, you are straying from, uh, you know, the game itself. And uh, yeah, if you just use that as a, as a yardstick, is this coach respecting the game? Is he putting the game first? Or is, by his actions, is he trying to put himself above the game or interject? So that's a right. great point. So you you started the podcast um, in 2018? Yeah, November 2018. Fantastic. And how many episodes in are you? We're 276, I believe. 276. Yeah. I got to put one out today because we're doing every Sunday. So probably 277 if my, the number is correct. Okay. That is a lot of reps. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Just getting warmed up, Greg. All right, fantastic. So you uh, made a decision to um, move to a Patreon model, to Patreon, um, Patreon to support you know your your efforts in Crown Refs. Can you talk a little bit about making that decision and um, what it has meant and what the opportunities are for officials uh, to pursue that with you? Sure. Thank you. Thanks for asking. You know, that's really the best part about um, what we're doing now with Crown Refs. You know, everybody, people ask me about the TikToks and the podcast, and I'm I'm first to always shout out, you know, uh, the community that we have. We got 157 people in our community. We got 10 of them listening right now uh, through a voice channel. So it's like um, we have a team of officials. Crown Refs is a team of officials and it's a family-like community where we support each other, where we pull for each other. And the best part about the community is when we meet in person. I've got an opportunity to meet a lot um, of the officials from our community in person at camps this summer. They've had the opportunity to meet at camps. They're going to be working together in the future at camps, in games. So um Something I'm most proud of is is our our community for officials that we have right now, and I could talk a little bit more about that in in a minute. But kind of how I was able to start the community is um, I gotta rewind back to when I launched my IPR service, which stands for Individual Performance Report. That is a film review service that I started in February of 2020, and that was a way for me to official to send me a game link, and I do a full. A uh, seven-part breakdown, a comprehensive emailed report that I send to the official. Um, the most information that they will ever receive about their officiating game, right? Because um, I felt like a lack of information, like at camps, and a lack of one-to-one -one instructional feedback customized for that one official. So I went real deep with the IPR. So fast forward, um, I've done, I've done sixty IPRs over those three years, but right around like thirty-five, I realized, wow, I, I'm I have a community here. I have thirty-five individuals that like want to work with me, wanted to go deep with me, and um, I built a, a real relationship with them. You know, they cold emailed me to start or DM, um, spoke to them there, got on a call with them, had a great. Uh, introductory call with them. They sent me their game. I watched their game, broke down their game, worked on the report for five, six hours, sent it to them. They were able to get new updates and new information on on them that they've never seen in their life, right? A way to like accelerate and grow your game almost overnight. Um, and then we would follow up with a Zoom call. So kind of that whole experience and that whole process doing it 35, 40 times, I said, wait, no, I, ha I have a community now. I know it's been one by one, but I basically need to take all 35 and 40 of these people 
and start this community. I just learned about Patreon and Discord and kind of creating a public um, platform to have a membership based community uh, where we work, you know, we do this year round. So that's kind of when, you know, the IPR and then I found Patreon and then I kind of loaded up, I loaded them up one by one into our community. And it was important that I started the community with them because they were part of my home team. They were part of the day ones that, that took a chance on investing in me and investing in themselves. So those are the people I wanted to start the community with, knowing that when it populates out and it grows from there, it's growing the right way with the right people that have, that are embodying this family-like team first culture that we have. So now as it's grown from one to 30 to 157 and wherever it's gonna go from here, the culture and the importance of being a great person and being a great partner and the fact that we're looking for only high character individuals that want to be part of a great team that love officiating. Um, so kind of establishing these pillars, it allows every new official that joins to be instantly connected because number one, they're a great person. Number two, they want to be part of a team. Number three, their love for officiating. And then number four, they've been impacted by my content. And those are the people I want to work with. Those are the people I want to bring in part of my family, the people that have cold reached out to me with like a great message that warms my heart when I wake up first thing in the morning or at night or whenever they get it to me. Like I, I, I really appreciate that. So I want to kind of show my appreciation for them and work with them and, and have them in our community. So um, I, uh, there's there's a lot of ways to grow within our community. I think we'll talk a, a little bit about our Discord and our Patreon, but those are some of the ideas with the way the the, the service, the IPR, has kind of been the platform for our private community. Okay, so the, the, you still offer the IPR service. How would somebody go about uh, making that happen if they wanted so to get cool. feedback on their video? Sure. Well, they send me a video. They send me a link. Um, even before that, they reach out with their interest and then we'll hop on a call so I can find out what they need to improve in and kind of get to know them and connect with them. Then they'll send me a game link and I do the report. Uh, it takes me about two weeks. I tell them up to two weeks it'll take. Um, and then once I'm done, I send it to them. And when they break it down, then they, uh, we meet for Zoom. Let me, let me tell you how I've been able to integrate the IPR into our community. Because when I first started the community, I was like, all right, I have the IPR and the community. Am I doing both? Am I not doing IPRs now? And then once I got another batch of IPRs, I said, wait a second, this doesn't have to be a separate service. It is a separate service, but we can integrate it into the mentor community because I do weekly training sessions. So now our one-to-one -one follow up IPR call can now be a group training session where I can still have that one-to-one -one call, but we can have an audience of people just like there are today on this call in the back that can listen in on the call and unmute at any given point, ask questions, provide feedback to that official. And that's the other cool part about our community is we have officials that are coming to show that support to the official that is getting their IPR and their game broken down to. So that's just another, just kind of what we're talking about, that positive culture showing support. Um, so I've been able to have the IPR as a training session. Yes, they're still available. And if anybody's interested, they can email me at crownrefs at gmail.com. All right. We'll also share a link in the show description as well. So tell me all about Discord. What is, uh, what is this as a platform for a community? Is this uh, difficult for people to learn? Is it uh, challenging? Is it like a Facebook group? I mean, it's got similarities to a lot of the previous platforms that we've used, but Discord is the best app, in my opinion, that Crown Refs has been on because it has the community all in one in real time. So it's a chat community. It's basically a 24-7 chat community. I mean, it's not going off every second of the day, but there's a potential for that to happen. Like if you had a ref question at two in the morning that you wanted to ask, well, someone, you know, across the West Coast or even from a different country might be available to respond. But Discord, do you want to screen share so I can show your audience? That would be fantastic. Okay, great. So yeah, Discord is our chat community. It's got 36 channels within Crown Refs. So Discord is a text platform, it's an audio platform and a voice platform. Um, and it's like a super group chat, okay? Now within those 36 channels, I'm able to basically cover every part of the game, 
Okay. Um, so I'll just run through a couple channels, the new member channel, channel one. <clears throat> so every new member that joins, it's important that they, that I introduce them properly on, on our platform. And it's not just random people entering with weird screen names, right? No profile picture. I want it to be a community. I want it to be a family. So think of discord as almost like a referee corporate center. It's our referee headquarters and everybody that enters, I'm there in the lobby, introducing them to the entire group that's already there. Um, and it, what's really cool is as soon as you join, you're going to have people that get to see a, a welcome to Crown Refs mentor branded picture. And then you share your story within channel one. So as soon as I introduce that new official, every other official can see their face and kind of read their story and build that instant team chemistry and camaraderie. So there's a couple of community channels. The first few, like we have a community chat. Um, there's a new release channel. So that's going to tell the group, all of my new content. I tell the group first, you know, where it goes, where they can find it, which episode is out first. Uh, then there's, there's a mentor schedules channel. So that's going to tell the group, uh, when the live calls are for the week. There's a lot of ways to grow in this community, whether it's the instructional content on Patreon, the daily um, conversations through discord or our live calls. And then obviously getting access to me whenever they want. Um, the Zoom link, we only use one Zoom link. So that's on channel four. It acts as like a nest. Then you find like, ask any question would be one channel. Now there's questions being asked within these other channels, but let's say you had a question that just you couldn't pinpoint into a specific channel. It could go uh, in that, in that um, channel. The first ref channel you really see is great partnering because that's just one of our pillars, you know? So you find officials sharing partnering stories. Hey, I worked with an official. He had a real negative attitude and didn't want to be there. How do I respond and how do I, you know, maintain my attitude and mindset? So that's just one example of a question or a story you would find just in that one channel. All of these channels almost act as like an educational platform within itself. Cause then you scroll down, you go to the mindset channel. I'm a phys ed teacher. Um, I consider myself almost like a life coach. I'm just in, in advice mode all the time. I feel like I just want to give to people. Um, so mindset would be an example of where I can communicate some of those tips. We have a communication channel. Uh, I also labeled it rapid response. It's almost like the written version of our rapid response podcast. If you have a question on how to respond to a coach or a player or just share a story on what worked for you. That's um, a channel for you. It has a play sharing channel. So that's an opportunity for the official to clip a play of themselves and get instant feedback from our community. And the difference is you're getting that feedback from a group that wants to support you, that does support you, that's part of your team, and from people that are working on their ability to teach and mentor and develop others. So you're getting this instant feedback from this community, not just random refs from Facebook and Twitter. Wow. Fantastic. So is this, is this like the only discord for basketball officials that you know of? It is. And it is. And I think every group should have a discord, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll happily be the first one. I, I spoke to one official and they have a, they had a little private discord. So there was one official I spoke to that had it, but no, I haven't spoke to any other officials that have a discord, but I would highly recommend any other officiating groups to start their discord. Yeah, I know it started as a gaming, uh, you know, a platform mm -hmm. for gamers to communicate. So it's it may uh, take a while, but I know it's also moving, you know, into other areas. So and, and it's super powerful, obviously. Um, and what was your learning curve like, uh, you know, running a Discord server? Yeah, the learning curve was basically I had the idea to start the community back in uh, March of 2021. And I, I kind of went dark for uh, from March all the way to like August. I've still put out content. I was I still had enough to put out, whether I was putting up some older stuff or a new podcast here, but definitely not my normal uh, output of work. And it's because I was building this. I was building out the Patreon. I was posting uh, over 200 posts that nobody was there. Nobody was there. It was a, it was an Island by itself, but I wanted to build it this way. When I told all my friends then it was already built up, it's not like, Hey, we're going to a new city and there's no construction done. No, this city is already built up. Right. So, um, but yeah, I just took my time, seven months of just kind of learning discord, listening to a couple podcasts on how to set up your own discord server. It's, it's very simple platform to be honest. I think it's super basic, 
but it allows you to go super complex with the possibilities. I mean, we have 36 channels now, but we're going to be creating new channels. And I'm always listening to our group for suggestions. Like Pedro's on the call right now. It was his idea to start a camps channel. The camps channel has turned into, like I said, a platform for officials to connect about camps. And then more importantly, make arrangements to room together at camps or make arrangements to go out to dinner at camps. And that's the coolest thing for me is to see officials like in Texas, um, they went to 10 of our officials went out to dinner. Some of them, it was their first time meeting. They're wearing their crown refs gear, taking pictures, like feeling that instant connection. So that kind of just speaks about the strength of our community and the positive culture we have in it. But discord was, was fairly easy and um, just did a lot of lead up work. And now it's kind of already, done and we can add pieces here and there to it all right fantastic well you got 10 officials that sounds like a really strong community uh at a camp really tremendous so how do people become a part of this community what are the steps that yeah. people need to take uh, in order to make that happen and join that community? sure you know I, I don't do a lot of selling or promoting of it i probably could do a lot more because it seems that um, a lot of people are uninformed on how to actually do it, how to sign up and what it entails. But I like that because I want it to be organic and I don't need a hundred people joining tomorrow. I want one. I just want to meet one person each week. That's just an arbitrary number. But, um, you know, so they, they contact me. You can contact me directly. I have a Patreon um, homepage. It's patreon.com backslash crown refs. But there's so much information um, and details to our group that there's really no way I can communicate it all through one page. A lot of time, you know, I, I could share the Patreon page. You can go through it. You can look at it. It'll give you a general sense. But then when you, you hop on a 45 minute call with me, you're going to say, wow, I didn't know it, it had all of those details. Right. Um, so back to answer your question, if you're interested in joining our community, you can reach out to me on any of the social channels. You can email me with your interest because everybody that's interested, I like to meet them first before I even bring them in. Because back to adding high character individuals only, you know, there's been a few calls that I hopped on where I just knew it wasn't a good fit. And, you know, honestly, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in people joining just so I can make a little extra money. I, I want the right people to join and we're going to go slow and we're going to do it the right way. And, um, we're going to give back and add value and provide value to, uh, to people. So, um, patreon.com backslash crown refs, or just reach out to me directly and I can walk you through it. All right. Fantastic. We will make sure that those links are available as well in the show description. Um, is there, there's a, a pricing component to this. Can you just briefly go over that? Yeah, sure. I, I added three available tiers just because I wanted to make it as affordable and as accessible as possible. And hopefully people appreciate the pricing because I was going to, um, I was going to price it higher initially, but then I had to adjust because I wanted to, I, I had to, I was asking the wrong question. It was selfish. I was asking myself, what do I think it's worth? And the real question would was what's as cheap, how affordable can I make it so I could make it as accessible as possible to impact the most amount of officials to get the most right amount of people to want to join. Um, so the pricing, there's three options. There's really only one option, to be honest with you. We have a pro tier, which is seven. We have a plus tier, which is 15. But really, the mentor group is is what we're doing here. I want everybody to who joins to join the mentor group because that gets you access to all of our live calls. The call we're on now, right? Everybody who's on it is part of our mentor group. So they signed up at the $25 tier. And anytime I hop on a call, I don't even talk about the two bottom tiers. Um, it's just kind of like a consolation prize. If if maybe the twenty five was they couldn't afford it at this time, I respect everybody's you know financial situation. It's got nothing to do with me. So you know whatever works for you. But I kind of wanted to provide a few different options. And I'm thinking about actually adding one more tier. It's going to be called one v one. You're the first. Uh, person I've told it's going to be called one V one and it's an opportunity to hop on uh, two live calls, one, two one-to-one -one live calls with me per month. So I'll probably roll that out next month. But right now we have the pro tier, which is $7 that gets you access to um, most of the podcast and a lot of the videos, as well as the discord text community. The plus tier gets you access to 100% of the Patreon content. 
and the text community. And then the mentor tier gets you access to 100% of the content, the text community, and the voice calls and the, the Zoom video calls. It sounds like mentor community is where you want to be. <laughs> Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Hey, so um, you're, you've been putting out some great content from a camp setting where you're providing signals and mechanics advice and you've got officials in there working and it's high quality film and audio and really tremendous. Can you tell us about that camp experience and uh, pr your preparation for that and how it all went? Yeah, I mean, I've, what I've been doing before I even went to camp, I had an opportunity to be a clinician. Uh, my first time being a clinician this summer at two camps, Roger Ayers and JB Caldwell. So big shout out to them for putting me on. But I've been doing like a lot of clinician work with Crown Refs, right? It's training and developmental content, which is what you'll find at a camp. So I knew the camp setting provided the perfect canvas and bed for my content, for any ref content, I feel, because that's where officials go for content. You're going to listen to feedback for you. You're going to hear presentations for you, right? So you're going to get that content that you can't really access anywhere else except for Crown Refs uh, and a better official. Um, but yeah, so I, I was really excited about being able to film as a clinician, being able to record clips of the game, and then being able to record my post-game feedback to these officials. So uh, Roger was was all about it. You know, when he asked me to, to come down, he, he gave me the, the lifelong invite and said, I can come and bring my film crew and film anything I wanted. So um, I knew that was going to be great content for officials to see because we've never seen access to a camp before. Nobody records at, at camp. They just take pictures. They may put out a quick little video, um, but nobody is recording this stuff. Nobody's giving access to this stuff. So that's something I knew that was an opportunity, a growth opportunity opportunity and it would it would um, create some really good content so what you're seeing is me in virginia at roger Ayers camp um giving a lot of post game feedback and then roger also allowed me to have a, a signal school session so i had two signal school sessions in a dance studio with mirrors it was like the perfect setting to to work on your mechanics and just a cool story about signal school that actually started with the mentor group that is with us today um on zoom so the the Signal School, it actually started even before the mentor group, just as content, as a post, as a, as a series. Um, back to Pedro. Pedro was one of the first people I, I did Signal School with when he came to work with me. So I kind of been practicing this Signal School a title or this session. So once um, I started my community, I knew that that was going to be a reoccurring session that we're going to do over Zoom. So that's exactly what I do with my group over Zoom. So it was really cool and natural and um, just the right timing where I was able to make a physical session out of that. So I got my proper training over Zoom. And then when it was time to do the physical session, I was definitely in my element. So um, it's nice to be able to kind of document um, the signal work and the practicing and all of the feedback. So, and then the second camp was JB Caldwell's camp in Atlanta, which is uh, I'm halfway done with that footage, I still have some more to do. And um, yeah, it's all about the full screen vertical video with the high quality mic and then just press and play and record and let me go. So, Well, that's the thing that's striking about the content is the quality, the audio quality, video quality, et cetera. So your vast production team came with you. Of course, I'm supported by a production team, uh, but unfortunately it's my dog and my cat. Um, yeah. But uh, tell me about, you know, the, the tech involved. I'm curious about that. Well, the production team, I mean, I found uh, two videographers, one in Virginia and one in Atlanta through Instagram. You know, I knew I, uh, I mean, I didn't fly anybody down from New York. I don't have a reoccurring team, although I do have someone in New York that I use uh, for a couple of different shoots that I've done. Um, but I just found the, the first, per, literally the first person I found on Instagram it said videographer, uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, sent him a DM, sent it back to me. He told me he worked in sports. He did a video for the Carolina Panthers and I don't need to see anything. I don't need to spend time like researching the right videographer. Like you have the equipment. Good. You like, um, videoing people. Good. You have a mic. Great. Then I'll meet you here. And so, yeah, so Jake Riggins, shout out to Jake Riggins. He recorded in Virginia. And then I found another official named Taniqua through, uh, through Instagram. She showed up. 
uh, on Saturday to record. And then she wasn't available the next day. So she asked one of her friends to then come Saturday. So these are people that I just meet, that I've just met, um, that I reached out to cold to, to, to help out. And, and really the production is just, I don't even know what, what camera it is. Um, I don't, not well equipped in, in different cameras, but, um, just a high quality camera with a mic. That's all we need. There's no lighting. There's, there's no other team telling me where to go or what to say. It's just, you know, turn the cameras on and, and let's record some, some referee content. Well, kudos to you. It's really high quality content and super valuable. Um, so I'm impressed. Well, that's all I can say. Hey, so um, if, let's take a look now at the broader um, the state of the game, right? We, obviously, the, over the past couple of years, uh, there have been dramatic uh, forces at play in our society, and um, it's affected the game with shutdowns and health and safety protocols, et cetera. But we, it seems as though we're returning to normal. What do you see at your, the levels that you work, the state of the game? And... Um, what are your thoughts on it? Um, well, I just think the state of the game with as far as just respect, I just think back to that respect thing. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to speak about anything with the pandemic or, you know, COVID. It's just not my, uh, my, not my cup of tea or my expertise, but I definitely think we're back, you know, um, we were back last year. So we're, we're two, two, three years removed from 2020. Um, and just the state of the game. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't like to generalize and, and speak in big picture too much, but just one thing I'll say is just respect for the game. And, you know, we were speaking earlier about coaches and players, and, and I just think we need to do a little bit better of a job. First of all, it starts with us. Accountability starts with us. So officials need to get better or the officiating industry as a whole needs to get better. And that's part of the mission of why I'm making content is because I want to raise the overall caliber and the overall level of officials. I want to just make a small dent in the reason why officiating as a whole has improved. So we can, there's, there's many strides we need to make there and we're continuously doing that. Um, we need more of it, right? We need more people to be passionate about the craft. Um, so I'm also trying to not, not only train and develop, but inspire officials to want to be better and, and get that burning desire inside of them. Um, so those are just a couple thoughts that, that I have. Yeah. Great. So, uh, but one thing we've seen has been there's sort of a uh, contraction of the officiating population due to uh, just decided to step away, or um, there's many issues reported, of course, with abusive officials, et cetera. The shortage, I think, in my mind, creates a situation where we're going to need a lot of new officials, and those officials are going to come in, and those officials are going to need to get up to speed. How do you see crown refs being in position to help um, with the development of this new wave of officials? I mean, the d development part we have down with our with our content and all the different channels we have. So the tr the training piece is there. It's already in. It's already in place. One of the cool things about being on TikTok now is it, it exposed me to a whole new audience. I think the first kind of three years of me doing it, it was specifically for officials. I always knew that it had, um, that it could kind of incorporate players, coaches, and fans as well. I, I knew that was a piece to it, but I don't think I really brought it out within those first three years. And I think what you're seeing now with TikTok is now we're, I'm put in front of players, coaches, fans, as well as refs now. So it's exposing me to non-officials, which is inspiring some of them to want to become officials. I put out content specific for people wanting or specific content to inspire people to want to be officials and then just regular content to educate, right? So um, viewers are able to see some of, some of this content and now they're reaching out directly to me. Like I, I saw your video, how do I become a ref? Right. So now we're, we're inspiring people to become refs now with the community in place and all the reach that I have around the country. Now, when somebody from New Mexico hits me up and says, I, I want to become official, how do I get started? Well, I already know we have four officials in New Mexico that I can reach out to and say, hey, how can we get this official certified? So then they bring me that information. I send it to the official. And then two days later, I get a confirmation email that says, hey, I'm enrolled in the class. I'm become a ref now. Thank you so much. So that's kind of like really making a difference, I think. And, and um, I'm, I'm really proud about that. I, I want to inspire 
not only officials to be better, but I want to inspire non officials to become an official. And if I can kind of be the reason or crown refs can be one of the early reasons why they even got into the game, then I think, um, then the developmental training aspect will come. Great. So TikTok, uh, focus of yours now, what, yeah. what's going on on the TikTok and the reach that you can potentially develop? Tell me a little bit more about it. I'm not, uh, I'm not up to speed maybe. All right. Well, listen, TikTok start off as a you know place just to dance for kids, but like every platform, they evolve, right? So um, TikTok has matured where now there's a lot of adults and you know the full basketball demographic is now there, a lot of officials there. I joined it in 2019, had no idea what I was doing and posted um, inconsistently and ineffectively for two years. Just didn't know what to post on there. I felt like there was no refs on there. Like I felt like it was just for dance or music and just didn't know where I sat. Fast forward to when I started to uh, create the community, that's when I started to hire more videographers to film and mic me up and do vertical video. So kind of once I started, I recorded No Off Season, which is the the series of me mic'd up in stripes. I, I I knew that it would work really well on TikTok, but I wanted to post it first to my Patreon community and lead kind of that be like a signature series to introduce the community to, right? Um, so posted it on Patreon first and didn't post it for almost a year onto TikTok. But fast forward to December of 21 is when I had all this content lined up and I just started posting in TikTok. I had 650 followers at the time. So two years of posting 650 followers by accident. Um, so then I started posting this mic'd up content. I got 5,000 followers in one day. Wow. Uh, I don't know what else to tell you. Like that's ne- that kind of growth has never happened. Crown Refs has been steady, consistent growth. Like I think if you look on it on a graph, it's just consistently growing. But then you hit TikTok and the spikes came. So I remember I went from 650 to 2,000 and then the next day was up to 4,000 and then the next day was up to 9,000 and then the next day was up to 13,000. I'm like, what is going on here? But I started to post consistently and post three times a day and respond to all my comments. So, you know, went from 650 to 30K like in a month. Then I ran out of that content, right? So I had to go record more. Once I recorded more, that brought me up to like 35. And then I went, quiet for another month. But then when I, re- when I recorded the camp content that you're seeing now, uh, it brought me up to right around 52K. And again, I don't care about followers. I've, I've been on record from day one, never cared about views, followers. So my, my viewpoint is the same on that. I mean, it's a blessing. It's pretty amazing to connect with so many people. I never thought I would have a large following like that. Never thought about 50K. But now I'm like, hey, let's get to 100. You know, why not? Why not make a big impact? So TikTok is the uh, my primary platform where I'm super focused on. I've taken a little bit of a backseat to the podcast just because I know there's a white hot moment right now and I can't um, allocate my time elsewhere if this platform is on fire right now. So that's where I'm at. Wow. Well, the, the reach is incredible and that obviously gives you a voice and the opportunity to touch people and, you know, pique their curiosity about officiating or help uh, break stereotypes about officiating or answer questions, et cetera. So you're uniquely positioned to do that. Um, you mentioned earlier your like, your like initial video that you ever did with Mr. Pink in the gymnasium. And I remember seeing those videos at the time and it's like, that's cool. That's cool. The audio was terrible. Mm. The video, you know, the quality, it's like all hey, these that's things. A but, that's a technical foul. You said terrible. But that's cool, right? And it's it's great to see, you know, all the things that you've done moving forward, embracing new technologies and helping uh, the officiating community, obviously, developing and cultivating your own community, obviously, and giving the opp- opportunity to others to join that community and embrace it and become better uh, and uh, achieve their officiating goals. So all I could do, Paul, is thank you so much for joining us today. And um, with uh, our effort at a podcast, a video podcast, 
Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share, the things that we haven't covered that maybe um, you'd like to impart to the audience before we go? Yeah, I would just like to, I know you've, you've spoken about me. I've had a chance to share a little bit about my background and what we're doing, but I want to give you um, a lot of credit and a lot of props. I know we've never really spoken about this. We've we've bumped into each other a few times on a Zoom uh, hallway, I'll call it. Um, but me and you really haven't spoken, and I've just been admiring you from afar and um, have really appreciated your dedication to give back to the game. I've really appreciated your ability to be a content creator and find new series and shows and titles and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I see it and I respect it. And then your ability to produce. I don't know if you have a film background or a radio background. I wanted to ask you, but your quality and your production is outstanding. And even with your background that I'm seeing now, you do, you do a fantastic job. So I just wanted to give you that public shout. Uh, thank you for all the work that you do, Greg. Well, thanks so much. I, again, I am supported by an elite tech team, well vetted. My, uh, yeah, but thanks so much. Because mm -hmm. I mean, one of the challenges we face is officials need training. Like you said and emphasized, we have got to be better, right, as officials. And there's so much area for growth. And um, one of the ways we're going to do it is through uh, social platforms. Um, I prefer YouTube, of course, um, because I'm old. Uh, I, knew, but, I got I got something to say about that, though. You said this is a video podcast. Are you going to convert this to audio so you can reach your audience through audio as well? Yes. Yes, we are. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Because I would have not been super happy if you would have just kept this on the video feed. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> We'll do some vertical video with it as well, Paul. That is well. I need the vertical <laughs> video. Uh, but I have to work on my dance moves before I can possibly consider TikTok. Uh, but, Paul, it's been fantastic catching up with you today, meeting you, uh, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one setting and getting you to share your thoughts and your platform and the opportunities that it offers to uh, basketball officials to get better and improve as officials. So I cannot thank you enough today for joining us. Um, I appreciate it. I cannot thank you enough. And you are now officially a friend of the show. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. And have fun at your son's wedding. Congrats. <laughs> Take care. Thank you for joining us today on the Voice in the Game podcast. Make sure to do all the things, the liking and the subscribing and the uh, rating on the audio platforms so that uh, we can get this in front of more basketball officials so we can all get better together. Take care.